I am here today with John Gabrielli, Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience here at MIT. He is also affiliated with the Harvard Graduate School of Education and he's director of MIT's Integra Integrated Learning Initiative. John, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure, thank you. So I heard you say a couple of times that your goal is to understand the organization of thought, emotion, and memory in the human brain. And you have done a lot of research on children's brains in particular. Can you share with us some of the most intriguing findings of, of your work? So, well, so I'm fascinated by the simultaneous universality of the human brain. Uh, the human brain empowers the human mind. The mind is what the brain does. I'm amazed that this physical structure, electrical, chemical, can make us have feelings, thoughts, uh, empower us to learn. Uh, so it just gives us all the, of the human abilities we have. At the same time, I'm struck as we study children how diverse children are in terms of their experiences and outcomes and risks. And so uh, aligning with everything else we know about life, uh, their brains differ, differ depending on what culture they grow up in, uh, whether one language or multiple languages are spoken in the house, whether they're born to a family that's affluent or born to a family that's poor, uh, whether they're born into, with a learning difference, uh, dyslexia, ADHD, autism, uh, whether they're at risk for things like depression and anxiety. So these children are born into a neurobiological lottery and they have brains and genes and experiences that will make life either easier for them or harder to navigate in the particular society in which they grow up. So what, from your research on children, or on the, on the um, functioning of the brain of children, what is it that we can learn for adults? Well, one, th one thing is sometimes people think that the adult brain is less able to change than children. And, and it's true as we get older we get stuck in habits in various ways, so that's an intuition we all have. But in fact brain plasticity, the ability of the brain to change with experience is tremendous in adults at all ages. And now the brain imaging has shown that spectacularly from 20 to 90 the brain can change a lot. So, uh, that, so that's a reason for huge optimism. At the same time we have a paradox which is as we get older our brain gets really good at doing certain things from our experience. So, if, uh, and our brain is really tuned to being excellent at what we do. So when we have to switch something, because the world has changed in technology, because the economy has changed and the kinds of jobs we need to get are different, that is an extra challenge, not because you can't change, but because you have to change so radically, perhaps, from what your brain got optimized to do. So, it, it, so it's both the tremendous plasticity, the changing uh, your habits of thought, developing new skills, it is an extra challenge as you get older because your brain has been committed to another set of skills and talents uh, from whatever you did before. And uh, what do we know from brain science or the science of learning then um, as to how this process can be facilitated? Well, we, we know a number of different things that help people learn things quickly and uh, we've had some success working with some, a company, for example, where they use some of these science of learning uh, uh, manipulations to help uh, employees learn material faster. So the more we can use laboratory experiments uh, that show us how people can learn most quickly, the more we can translate that into practice in, in the community and companies and so on that can help people learn. A second fascinating thing is um, we can also understand more about variation in individuals, what will be easy for them or harder. And we certainly want everybody to choose the path they want. But also it's also easier to succeed when you know that something comes more easily to you than not. And so, for example, we ran a, a course where we uh, had young adults learning Chinese for the first time in their life. And we took brain imaging uh, pictures of their brains, the structure and function of their brains, and see whether we could predict which young adult would learn Chinese better and which young adult would learn Chinese worse. And in fact, we found evidence that we could predict that on the basis of their brain structure and function. Now, if you're motivated enough to learn to Chinese, you can, you can learn it no matter what. So it's not an impossible thing. But it, maybe we can understand better you know, for whom a particular kind of new learning experience will be easy, and they'll be pleasurable, they'll be excited, they'll be motivated. And for another person, the very same kind of learning may be extraordinarily difficult, and maybe they would be happier with a different path. So if you don't mind, I would like to push you a little bit on this. Maybe yeah. you can draw on this example of the company that yes. you just mentioned. Um, just sort of elaborate a little bit on what, what good practices. Yeah, so, let, so I'll, uh, we, we used one particular uh, lesson that we've learned from laboratory research. So as a student, uh, people know that one of the nicest things to get is a practice test. It helps you know how well you learn the material. But what science has shown is that taking a test is one of the best ways of learning about the material uh, in the long run. 
So if you could study something twice, and then you'll do better than if you study it once. But if you study it once and then take a practice test on it, even when you give wrong answers and you're not corrected, your final performance is the best of all. So a practice test is better than spending more time studying something. So we took exactly this lesson into the actual company with an actual video that they required their employees to learn. And we just stuck in practice questions, very short, very simple ones. Uh, and then we asked a day later, what do they remember from the video? And the performance went up considerably for those employees who got the practice questions. We asked one more question. Nobody likes to be tested, really. You know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we asked them you know, about, about their experience, how they liked it. And in fact, the, the employees who got the practice questions liked the experience more. We think that it's because it was more interesting. You know, oh, gee, here's something I know or didn't know. Uh, so it was nice because it wasn't that they uh, felt tested or prodded or, or, or challenged in some unpleasant way. In fact, they found it more engaging and they learned more. So those are the kinds of things that we really like, things where uh, we both improve the rate of learning in a practical way, but also have the people involved feel motivated and engaged uh, better than if we hadn't used those kinds of uh, augments for rapid learning. Um, so emotion does play a role. Motivation plays a role. Emotion plays a tremendous role in memory. In fact, we have a structure called the amygdala, uh, whose number one job in, our, in many ways is to have emotion drive learning. So it makes sense that things that we care about, either intensely wonderful or terrible, uh, are, are things that we want to remember. And so that if we can engage that structure and the neurochemistry that goes with it, uh, that does propel learning very powerfully. And does the relevance of this structure vary over time? It seems to, uh, uh, to be very consistent from childhood th through adulthood. Uh, emotion, we remember what things are emotionally powerful for us uh, at all ages. The one thing that seems to change is that as people get considerably older in their 60s and 70s, that part of the brain becomes, seems to become tuned to positive experience and less interested in negative experience. It's a kind of an emotional wisdom, uh, uh, as if you know, you're just going to focus on the positive things in life. Uh, and, and so this positivity bias uh, that's been observed in, in, in older individuals, older adults, uh, seems to be uh, linked to changes in how the amygdala encodes experience. And we have another pathway, if I could mention, that's also highly relevant, I think, for learning, which is the reward system of the brain. So through animal and human research, we know there's structures in the brain that respond to reward. They're turned on by things like video games. They involve dopamine. And they also are very powerful modulators of learning. And we know that when we're highly motivated, it's a pleasure to learn. When we, take, when we have to learn material we don't care about, it's a burden and it's hard to get ourselves to learn. So the more we can engage that brain system, the motivational system, uh, to want to learn, to be eager to learn, to be intellectually curious, or, uh, the better will, uh, learning occurs. Do you have any, any data on professions? Is it the same across all professions? An intellectual task versus more practical task? Uh, yeah, I don't know about professions. I, I, think, it, I think it works uh, across a huge range of things because in animal research, they'll do things like food when you're hungry. Uh, in humans, they'll do cash rewards. But uh, even things like just curiosity about a question, if a person's interested in a question, uh, this part of the brain turns on the reward areas before you give them the answer. So if you want to know the answer to something, even if there's no money or food involved, it turns on as well. So it, it's a very broadly tuned system that when we're motivated to learn something, it lets us learn it uh, more powerfully. So another striking um, uh, line of research, uh, both in patients with brain injuries and brain imaging, is what we're understanding more and more about the social brain. And uh, the, you know, how the brain is potentiated in us to allow us to interact with others, to understand their feelings and interests, uh, which is something that we're very, even the smartest AI, I think, is very far, or the smartest robot is very far from having the intuitive understanding of another person's feelings, thoughts, desires, and so on. And so, uh, in many ways, that kind of experience or talent or human nature has not been valued in our educational system. We want kids to learn calculus or history or the Constitution, and we don't have courses in relating to people. But because that's, our brain is so brilliant, spontaneously uh, we're given the machinery to understand what people are thinking. There's a whole phrase called theory of mind, you know, where we understand what the other person is thinking, even if they're wrong, even if we disagree with them, we can understand that they have that thought. And those kinds of uh, skills that the brain endows us with are incredibly unique to humans uh, in the workplace. And so maybe a thousand years from now, there'll be robots that do it as well as humans, but not for a very, very long time. And so I think some of the human talents 
that we accept and we think, well, that's not a work thing. That's just how I relate to people. Uh, in fact, are essential as we need teamwork across people, across cultures, across nations, and large groups working to solve problems. And so I think those very things that we don't learn in school will be the uh, essentially uh, uniquely human capabilities that will allow people to play va invaluable roles at work, uh, you know, coupled with obviously some sort of professional or technical skill. Often we're afraid of learning in some way. We think we won't do well at it, or we haven't learned for a while, let's say if we're not in school and used to taking tests all the time. And it turns out there's a lot of research that shows how we think about ourselves as learners really influences learning itself. So there's beautiful work from Carol Dweck about the idea of growth mindset. If we think we have a certain set of abilities and we're good, we can't go beyond those, uh, we fail at a lot of things. If we convince ourselves, or if we, and if we deeply believe that we can learn something, that the harder we work and more approach we, different approaches we take to something, we can succeed, then there's lots of evidence that people just learn better because they believe in themselves, but that belief has to come first. And if, you'll, you know, if you believe you can learn, you can learn, but you really have to believe that. Uh, but it makes a big difference, and that could be a power that's available to many learners facing new challenges. Even very simple little things re are, show remarkable power, uh, both in the brain and in the mind. So for example, if just before you learn something, you explicitly think about why it matters to you, uh, regardless mm -hmm. of it does or not, and you start make a little list, like here's why it matters to me, there's a, a compelling science that people become better learners. Uh, so, so it changes brain function and it changes rate of learning. If, if people spend a few minutes going, this matters for me because of X, Y, and Z. So they motivate themselves. They find it in themselves the capacity to learn something powerfully if it relates to who, who they feel about, who they are, and, and, and become optimistic learners. And does it matter at all how people feel this experience matters? So if they feel a lot of pressure, for instance, to, you know, learn because otherwise they might lose their jobs or they might, you know, have other negative, face other negative consequences? Too much stress, too much pressure uh, impairs learning. And that's true for all of us, even, even if it's something we like. Uh, so finding that, that right amount of, uh, of intensity, you know, if we're, if we're too lethargic, we don't learn. If we're too pressured, we don't learn. Finding that middle space that, uh, is, is, is optimal. Uh, and so we want to encourage people to get there, to be motivated enough uh, from their own perspective to be optimistic as learners, but not so pressured uh, that the, 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 the uh, pressure, you know, that the pressure harms their performance. And that's true for all of us. If, we, if the stress is too great, uh, there's lots of evidence that we become, all of us become poor learners. So there's a huge role then for a good mentor or a good company, a good employer to think about how to reduce the stress and at the same time enhance learning. Yeah, the, 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 those of us who study this from a psychological perspective think that this is really an easy thing if you take advantage of it because it's, it, it's at most respectful of humans at one level and it's very cheap. <laughs> you know, you're get, To get people to say, um, please let's think for a few moments about why we want to learn this for our own lives, for our own character, for our own purposes. That's a pretty modest request of somebody, but it makes a big difference because it lets them connect the task in front of them with who they are, their aspirations for their future uh, in a very conscious and explicit way. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you very much.